Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Janet Lee. When a person can take a keyboard and an instrument made out of natural things and play it and bring forth spiritual things, that is a summation of something really wonderful and beautiful. And Janet Lee, that's what you do. God bless you. And so, Today, beloved audience, I call on you to understand that as I begin to minister in manifest realities over a network, not speaking of the broadcasting network, but a network of Holy Ghost reveals, there will be some things in this study and in this teaching that are deep and that to some persons will seem to be complicated and difficult to comprehend. Dear beloved audience, I want to encourage you that I will not leave you hanging. I will in the course of time if you will be patient. I will be your teacher. I will teach you these deep, very consequential meanings that have to do with what the Bible teaches in Corinthians are dimensional aspects that God's people need to know and need to learn. There are so many consequential things in the Bible people are not aware of. They get the idea sometimes that they don't really need to know hardly anything. They just need to uh, 
to think that they can just not know much anything, but somehow they'll be all right. But you know, that is not Bible. That is not the Spirit of God. And that is not the plan of the Holy Ghost. God wants you to build those pillars, those seven pillar, pillars, and plant them in the wilderness of the world that surrounds you so that there will be a path that will be cleared around about you and protect you. And as you get into the Holy Ghost, first starting with the Holy Spirit, and as the Holy Spirit increases in its volume in your life, in whatever the dimension of your kingdom of God inner temple is, and fills it unto the fullness of its capability, and then becomes a Holy Ghost empowerment. Until you reach those levels, you will not be fully cognizant or in recognition of all the meaningfulness that the Bible has to share and the things that the Bible says. You can't get by without being able to count. You don't want to be lazy in your faith and frivolous in your knowledge. And you don't have to be, nor do you need to allow yourself to be saddled with some kind of mental disposition that you do not have the education or the ability or the brain work to be able to do this because that is anti-Jesus. Because the Bible says that we, meaning all of you people who believe in the Savior, can do all things through Jesus Christ who will strengthen us. And Jesus, who taught that it is possible for some who can believe to go through the needle's eye, and who also taught that with God, the things that are not possible with man are possible. So the all things are possible is the, the realm that we are mediating in, in this teaching today. And I have some outstanding things to share with you, an event that happened to me last night to share with you. But you need to hang and hold. And if there are words that I say that you don't understand, remember Shakespeare added 5,000 new words to the language. But in the manifest realization teachings, there have been added over 5,000 words. So more words than Shakespeare added to the language the manifest is adding to the human language. Ladies and gentlemen, beloved audience, I plead with you, if you want just a closer walk with the Lord, to believe that you can be endowed, to believe that there is transfiguration potential as it was in the days of Moses and the 70 elders to transfer experienced spirit experience and share it as Moses did his spirit with 70 of the elders. That spirit energy and spirit knowledge, knowledge can be shared with you so that you instantaneously come to the forefront of understanding and comprehending these things. It is the will of God. It is the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we did a broadcast announcement. I want to share a few things of that so that we have the commonality of reasonability of helping people to understand what that announcement was saying. It was talking about a spinning power of the Holy Ghost. 
Now, you do always know that something that spins is alive and it has energy. And you do always know that things that spin can be of a very powerful nature, whether it be spiritual or physical. And when we talk about the spinning power of the Holy Ghost, when it talks about the mighty rushing winds of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2, 2 KJV, we begin to think of Elijah. We begin to think of Ezekiel. We begin to think of Job. We begin to think of Elijah who had experiences with whirlwind type of experiences. And now we begin to think of the day of Pentecost in the upper chamber when disciples of God and elect persons of God were waiting to get into a oneness of the Spirit. And when they achieved that moment, a mighty rushing wind filled all the house where they were sitting. This whirlwind is like a breath of God. And it is how the Holy Spirit with that mighty rushing wind, which is a quickening wind. It's powerful enough to quicken the dead and bring them to life again. It's powerful enough to quicken the most sick person, the most suffering person, to quicken the lost person, the depressed person, the mentally in difficulty person. And it can open the boundaries of revelation. The whole lot of humankind has a, a need of assurance of something that they can depend upon. Something that will support their physical and spiritual needs and that can energize them at all the major junction of their life's operations. The outlay is dependent on different fields. But often in some of those fields there is a fuzziness and a lacking of expedience. However, the Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus Christ to be with the person always and forever. There are mom momentaneous will of God provisions that action each person who is led by the Spirit. Are you led by the Spirit? Or are you led by the human strain of nature or the genie's of your genes, or the anger of your passions, or the swell of your pride, or the lust of your greed. Are you led by the Spirit of God? There lingers between the drift, the wane, and the forward unction, the knowing of the remedy, and the tangent of how to be led by the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes, we know. You pray, and sometimes things seem to not occur. Seems to not have answers to prayers. So the duplicity of your prayers can get boring. And that lacking of your reaching and never being able to touch the point of the need summit is painful. But there is more needed than what you may have assumed in your mirror mind image that is the lacking of your soul. Do not pass lightly on these words. 
They have the power to enable you to gain strength and keep you from slipping into half-heartedness. Some people think simplicity is the answer. However, simplicity often belongs to subtraction and division and is just a mental package customed for leaving off knowledge and shortening up the consistent consistency that grows greatness. So those things that are constituting greatness need to be fed energy, need to be fed action. Life is a path marked by turns and bends and road constructions that are sometimes rough and dangerous and even non-trajectory of quality. Sadly, many people live in the classical myths of false hopes. But there are psychological incrustations that can happen to the mind of persons who keep experiencing a failure of pertaining to those hopes. I am not suggesting you suddenly attempt a leap into a perfect or perfection mode. However, I am leading you, if you will perceive it, to an especially private place of refuge in the Holy Spirit. You may have to break out of the shell that caused a lack of advancements due to your religious indoctrination of certain limits. There are spiritual tessellations of pure reality that belong to you as glories. They belong to you. And it says that in the book of Corinthians, that there are glories that belong to you before the foundations of the earth were laid. You own them. They belong to you. You have your name on them. They are only available through the Holy Ghost. The Bible begins with spirit. How that the spirit in the beginning moved over the waters. And then it ends about spirit. When it reveals that the whole book of Revelation consists of the spirit prophecies of Jesus Christ. It is time for the book of stunning mysteries that have been hidden from the beginning of time to be opened. It is time they be untangled, those mysteries that have been blocked by the dark prince of storms and flutter. You who are Bible readers, this is your moment to get into that group of whosoever has an ear to let them hear what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is saying to the church. Yes, now is the time. Well, in part two, I had another broadcast announcement. And God has put on me to review some of these things. They are so unending. They are so super connected. They are so relevant. They are so tangent to your need, to your becoming super. They are essential for you. We talked in this particular announcement how that Jesus was walking along surrounded by a crowd of people interested in him, including his disciples, and people who wanted to hear his message. And then he spoke out and he says, I, I feel virtue has gone out of me. And some of the disciples were amazed. You mean in this crowd because somebody might have touched you? <laughs> you felt virtue go out? It, well, that's hard to understand. But he felt not only the virtue go out, but he understood in that spiritual knowledge that he had, that interval of Holy Ghost infilling, 
that it issued out from the fringe of his garment, and that the virtue became a healing power for someone, a healing deliverance. Now the point of this thing about virtue is that it is connected with energy that has different levels of charge. 30-fold charge, 60-fold charge, 100-fold charge. And then there are some persons like Jesus who could even go beyond that charge into the plu, plu perfect. Numbers beyond numbers. Belief beyond belief. Yonders beyond the yonders. Virtue is a kind of energy. And it can transfer from one body to another. And there are energy dots throughout the universe, which is information that cannot be destroyed. And those energy dots by the Holy Ghost are potential to get hold of. They hold in them the memoir. The memoir, M-E-M-W-A-H, which is the memory of all things that is engaged in the power of life that creates angels and rulers. So, this then reenacts my teaching about the charge and about scriptures like in Corinthians 14, 16, KJV. The inward man is renewed day by day. Is that you? Someone says, that's just talking about the man. No, it's not. Man can also be the abbreviation for woe man. So just how you want to read the scripture and take the scripture, even though sometimes the translators were a little clumsy, the potential is to turn it in so that every one of you has a chariot of your own. You see, a person has to keep their spirit charged. Ephesians 4, 3, KJV says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Day by day you've got to do this. Day by day you've got to be renewed. If you don't get yourself renewed day by day, you are skip roping into a check mark that is not part of the fitting sequences of the Holy Ghost. Be renewed in the spirit of the mind. You mean the spirit has a mind that's different from the human mind? Absolutely. You have a brain. That's a physical mind. But you also have a spiritual mind. And you have to get a, a charge going and keep a charge going in that spiritual mind. And in the Bible, sometimes it's called power, like the Holy Ghost with power. Sometimes it can be referred to as fire, the Holy Ghost and fire. It's a spiritual grid hookup, a network, and it's emtricity, like electrical charge that you get out of the plugs, but something vastly more renewing and powerful. Now, Philippians 119 KJV says, Where are you at with the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ? And I mentioned in my teaching, isn't that absolutely engineering? Isn't that engineering of the writership of Paul? Where are you with the supply? He realized that there were levels of supply. And you could be av find availability to those levels of supply. It's not just a little squirt. It's not a drop. There is a plenty, a horn of plenty, a plethorium of plenty. I want to accentuate that angels have to have a charge. 
And when the war in heaven was happening, the angels who had the most charge and were the most creative of their wisdom won the war. The disciples went out and sometimes they could not with the energy level that they had, with the charge level that they had, they could not cast out demons. Certain demons just would not pay attention. We know who Paul is. We know who Jesus is. We don't know who you are. There is this thing, then, that charge has to do with spirit recognition. It's a title. You reach a certain level, and that begets you a titleship. You reach another level, and that begets you a different titleship. And as you keep growing in these different titleships, then you it begin to reach recognition. So that when Jesus would even come into the presence of a person, the spirits of the dark forces could recognize his spirit immediately because of the titleship of the charges that he carried because when he was birthed, he was born with the Holy Ghost in his fullness. And the Bible says that the Spirit did not have to be given to him in measure because he was already filled to the fullness. So we see by that scripture, there are, there are measurements. One of the meanings of power and charge that the Bible sometimes uses is the word strength. To give you strength. The charge has strength. Samson had a special kind of charge that not only was powerful of his spiritual aspect, but brimmed over into the physical aspect. Sometimes that can be allowed to happen so that you can actually be given physical health, physical strength, physical dynamics, and then that can slip upwards by an upward pulling gravity of the spirit so that it begins to engender your brain, your physical brain, and it becomes capable to do things you could not do before. I had a dream, not last night, but the other night. And I dreamed that this man appeared, and I knew he was from the father's house. And there was this huge chalkboard that was not made out of any material but it was part of the sky but I could realize there was a separation of bounds and he looked at me and he said it is time for me to teach you further in some of the new maths that have to do with the word of God and he drew this line that had sort of a bow to it on one end all the way across and a bow on the other end. And he says, I'm going to teach you double. I'm going to teach you double about the curvatures. And he went on, he said some other things that at some point in the future I will get a chance to share with you. But I have so much on the plate for now. Well, the thing being weighed, being weighed in the balance and found wanting, tells about the kind of spirit charge you have or don't have. About the kind of faith that you have or you don't have. About the point of having entered into the justification that allows things that were not done just right, that were lacking in some areas, that to nevertheless, by the Spirit of God, be justified over. But you don't have it. You haven't applied it. You didn't seek to apply it. And you're weighed in the balance and found wanting because you don't have the charge of the Holy Ghost to the minimum requirement. The Bible says in Proverbs 16:2, the way of man are the ways of man are clean in his own sight. Get a hold on this. But the Lord weigheth or weighs the spirits. You mean it's possible to weigh a spirit? 
They've always said that you couldn't weigh a spirit. But the Bible says a spirit can have weight. Not everybody can understand how to differentiate that weight. But God can. And God has revealed that secret to me. And I am using it in my book that I am writing called the Black Hole Manual. And in, in Strong's Concordance, Hebrew Dictionary 8505, it talks about this weight equaling a balance and equaling to measure and equaling as weight dimension. Spirits have weight, which is a charge dimension. And different spirits have different kinds of dimensions depending on the degree of the level of their charge. A 30-fold dimension is different from a 60-fold dimension, and a 60-fold dimension is different from a 100-fold dimension, and a 100-fold dimension is different from a, a step beyond dimension. I call it pluperfect, borrowing from some English grammar. So there are scriptures for this. And we find that in the articles of the Old Testament, like Numbers 785, it talks about the charges of silver, the charges of incense, the charges of gold. We think of that meaning something different, but it in addition to meaning something different, it also does contain the supplementary aspect of the actual weight because every, the measure in that time also meant the weight. And it's fairly clearly described that way in the Bible. And Levi's 1935 mentions weight or the measure. Numbers 7, 13 through 43 talks about a charge of the weight. First Chronicles 28, 15, wait for the candlesticks. Second Corinthians 4, 17, exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. What? It's there, folks. Old and New Testament. Eternal weight. Glory has weight. Weight has the divisiveness and the differentiality of charge. And it is an exclusivity that is so profound and so utterly admissible into the overcoming aspect of life that there is no compromise in that to failure. Well, I had an incredible experience last night. I'm going to share it with you in just a little bit. But first, let's get started on part three. What is the Holy Ghost? There is a spiritual subvention, S-U-B-V-E-N-T-I-O-N, -E a help for the things that gravel beneath your feet as a path not clearly defined. Bind your mind into mining the light. Feel and taste the song of the holy, holy, holy chant. Bend and blend the spirit throughout the sourdough of confusion so that new flavors of the Holy Ghost will overcome all confusion and can speak to you in translating tongues of angels. Light the torch. The torch flames of prayer that will burn away the gross of your personal things, of ponderance that are a hindrance. You are, in, you are surrounded by invisible song lattices. Let me say that again. You are surrounded by invisible song lattices. How often has there been discovered the undiscoverable? to become known the unknown, to feel the unfelt, 
to sing the unsung. How often in your life have you touched the untouched and reached to a point you had never reached before? We're talking about this invisible song lattice of cosmic and spiritual melodies. We're talking about the power of translating tongues of angels. We're talking about the castaway of hindrance. We're talking about letting the sunshine in. And forgetting not that there is a wisdom unfolding of deep pearl of multiple tints gleaming from the sunshine mountain. Interestingly, there is a... F- now listen to this one. Now this is a little deep point. And beloved audience, I will be with you. I will teach you these things. This is not some kind of guesswork. This is not some kind of imaginary uh, thing on my point, just making it up. This is a scientific fact. And Einstein won a great notice award for his knowledge on it, the subject. And I briefly mentioned it before, but we've got to mention these things because they've got to sink in. It's called photoelectric effect. Now, when we think of some of our new word manifest reveals, photo translation, photo transition, photo imaging, and many others, this sort of goes with it. Photoelectric effect that reveals when you shine a strong beam of light against a piece of metal, that the metal's electrons which absorb that light are able to escape the metal. Paul the Apostle reveals that the patterns of things in the physical on earth reveal the image of the heavenly. So let's take this photoelectric effect a little further. There are electric fields in the universe, and you as a human have a small electrical field. In fact, you have an organ. You have an organ that creates electricity for running of the pumps of the heart. Light waves have frequency vibrations of charge, charge, energy, charge, energy. Ah, you're beginning to get it. There's a snapping of the fingers, a clicking of your thoughts. And charge can represent weightedness. And weightedness can represent this energy of the Holy Ghost you must have in fullness. And even electron atoms trapped in metal lattice can be set free by their light waves, by the frequency vibrations of their light waves of radiation. This is real stuff. Because equations can measure the density loss the metal experiences after being hit by a photoelectric beam. Was that what happened when Peter was in prison? And they wanted, they wanted, to, they wanted to test this man before the, the crowds. They wanted to make a fool of this man. And then they wanted to kill him. And so... And so he was bound with his feet with shackles and his hands, arms were shackled. And there were men that had to stay in the jail with him to make sure there was no way that he could escape. And it could mean their death if he got away. And they thought there was impossible in the prison with the great giant gateways, something photoelectric happened to the metal of the shackles, to the point there were so many atoms that were released that the shackles just came apart and fell off his ankles and fell off his wrists. 
and the soldiers were just nullified, stunned, mentally made incapable. And Peter walked out of the prison, doors opened. This is Bible. I'm not making this up. Then there was this great iron gate, a huge mammoth, heavy, probably weighed a ton or more. And the Bible says that the gate opened of its own accord. Elements recognized the photoelectricity. Elements recognized the phototranslational, the photo transitional elements recognized the charge level of the Holy Ghost that was in Peter because by the time the shackles had fallen off and doors began to open and the men that were guards were paralyzed and could not move against him who were later put to death those men by the time that all happened Peter was in heavy top charge. And when he came before that iron gate, of his own accord, it began to open. And P Peter walked through that gate a free man. This is Holy Ghost stuff. Do you want in on that? You're not going to get in on it just by having a dib, a dab of the Spirit. You may only have a dimple. You may say, I feel like I'm full of the Holy Ghost. But that may only be a dimple's worth or an eyedropper worth. You need to fill the temple. And the temple needs to go into stretching. And that is one of the words that happens with this photoelectric effect. Because it begins to stretch the metal. And as it stretches it, the atoms escape. And so... It's so beautiful. Now, I don't want to close just yet I, I, because I have so much today, but just a little bit more before we take a break. Let's look at this. And let's think about this. There are anti-truth labels being constantly printed and stamped on everything. The godless and the forces dark claim there is no God of creation and no God of caring and love. Those evil disbelievers are in for a spirit-to-spirit -spirit lesson encounter of reveal they will never forget. What does the Bible have to say about anti-truth la labels being stamped on everything? We're going to share that with you in a little bit. And then I'm going to share with you, probably before I get into that, a Holy Ghost experience I had last night. Janet Lee at the organ as we take a break.
And again, Janet Lee, I apply to you all those wonderful things I said the first time. They're true again. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I woke up at 3 o'clock. And I had been awake a lot. And I was really wanting to continue to sleep. But a non-major but important physical appointment seemed to be something I would not get around. I needed to go to the bathroom. However, I had no idea that in addition to the non-major appointment that I had for that bathroom, there was a spiritual appointment that I had no knowledge was going to occur. So as I sort of stumbled my way into the bathroom, I was not there very long before the Holy Spirit began to come into that room. And it was so powerful. It was so real. I felt it through my whole body. It seems sometimes a strange thing as I look over the many years of my life, how often I've had experiences in the bathroom. I suppose it must be the exclusivity of the selective singleness of that provision that allows a very personal experience. Well, Before I get into the whole drama of it, I was being told here by our audio man that there's a little problem with a continuity of the band wave, some bobbling going on. And first, my thought is that this should not be happening because of all the the new equipment and the uh, the very expensive connection that we made with financial ex uh, connection with the company that we are doing this broadcast through to increase the bandwidth uh, to the highest point that it's available for a business even. And so that that should not be happening. But then as I began to think about it, I thought, wow. Is it possible that the spirit energy that is going out over these waves is actually affecting it that way? Now, before you put a no on that and think that you're going to brand it like you would brand the hide of a, of a cow, let me tell you a few experiences. Once upon some quite long time ago, God spoke to me by the Holy Spirit and said, go out and make a small circle and make it so that it's strong enough to stand on and it is about, it is, it's about three or five inches above the floor. And go and stand on it and I will cause my Holy Spirit to come upon you in a supernatural way. We had several people there with tape recorders because we wanted to record what was going to happen in that awesome service. The energy of the Holy Spirit was so strong that those tape recorders, none of them except my grandma's, could operate, would work. None of these people had had any problems with their tape recorders before. They always worked. They always recorded. And the spirit just stopped them dead. They could not record. Well, last night, the spirit of the Holy Ghost came upon me. And I was full of the electricity of it. And I began to go into languages of the Holy Ghost. Now, as to 
human languages. By the Holy Ghost, I have spoken the, in the tongues of several different languages. Arabic, East Indian, Chinese, Spanish, and others. But this particular Holy Ghost was none of those languages. It was more along the line of that utter private type of Holy Ghost language. The kind that prays for us mostly when we un are unknowing of what it is saying and it is praying for our benefit and help. It was a great unction and a great urgency, powerful thing. And as I begin to experience this, I, I just began to receive all these, this message. And I was like preaching to the world out there. And the, I spoke, I, I must have been there for 40 minutes preaching by my spirit and my mind to the world with these incredible things that I said that I don't remember ever preaching them before. And then, eventually, I went back to my bed. Now, the headboard of my bed is very near to a window to the outside. And the view through that window <coughs> is very interesting and very important. Across the little ways, there is a large house that has two chimneys on it, one toward the front, one back a ways. And I have sit there on the edge of the bed or even laid in bed and looked out the window and many times have seen those chimneys turn into Jesus Christ with his robe and his hands waving or raised. And John, the disciple, in the back, with his robe and his hands waving, following Jesus. But also, I put in the window a probably about nine and a half to ten inch, I'm not sure, a, a wide, a circled clock that was run on battery. And I We'll look at that at night, so whatever time of the night I wake up, I look at that to see what time it is. Well, the other night, a big full moon was coming right through that window, making it pretty difficult to sleep, so I closed the curtain and went and got this smaller clock that was in the bathroom and set it over to the side so that the curtain be, be closed, I could still see a clock. That clock was working at that time, that one that I moved there. But then, a few days later, after the full moon was gone, I noticed that that clock quit working, probably run down by battery or whatever, but I took note of it. Well, the Holy Ghost began to come on me again as I lay in bed. And as I looked over at the clock, I saw it turn into the head of my saint grandmother who had raised me and who was a prophet, a woman of God. And these thoughts came down like a dew from heaven. And I knew that far, far away from where I was in that room, on a planet called the Father's House, that Lily, my grandmother, had taken a body there, and that's where she was. 
And I was so rejoiceful at that. And then I began to think about lots of things. I began to think about what this meant, this Holy Ghost outpouring. And God began to speak to me that this series was going to unfold a time of many healings for many people. That this series was going to unfold signs and wonders of awesome accord. And that the magnitude of the star shine of this Holy Ghost time was going to be so full of magnitude that this word was going to change the life of a lot of people and bring many, many people into the manifest teachings. Blessed be the name of God. So, this morning, I, when I woke up, and my wife came around, and I was looking at the clock, and I thought it was only about, you know, certain time. I thought it was only, uh, you know, some, some minutes, about 20, 25 minutes or something like that to five. And my wife said, oh no, that, that clock stopped. It's not working. She said, the time is actually over an hour later. And she said, look, the little clock next to you, it's got the right time. And I looked at it and I thought, what? So I asked my wife, I said, did you, did you wind this? Did you charge? You know, I usually wind it. It works by winding a spring. That's how that works. Yeah. And uh, it's not a battery. That's right. It's a, it's a winding clock. And she said, no, I never touched it. So now I begin to look at that. And I thought, wow. One of the hands is right next to almost on five, and the short hand is on seven. Seven and five equal twelve. That is a sacred number. The second hand is stopped on nine. If you take twelve and nine, you get 16. Then according to manifest revealed math, you divide that, you get eight and eight. You divide that down finally to four. You divide that down to two. <coughs> and you get a duality of two ones. And then I thought, when I found out from Janet that she had not wound the other clock, I thought, well, the Holy Ghost power was so powerful, it stopped that clock dead in its track on those numbers. And that's why they also had significance. But then it, the energy went over, and it had to change the hands and the timing and wind that other clock because no one else did it. So it was going and it had the right time. And this was all happening by the Holy Ghost. And it was a message because it tied in to this teaching of the duality, which we will get to here in a little bit, Lord Welling. And... I just thought, oh my God, God is moving by His Spirit, moving in all the land. And how I want to see Him and look upon His face. And on the streets of glory, to share His wondrous grace. And so, 
There are these anti-truth labels being stamped, S-T-A-M-P-E-D, on everything. Daniel, KJV, 8, 8 through 11. I'm going to take some particular revelation out of this biblical description of, of some specific times, some of which have happened, some of which are yet to happen. And I am not uh, getting into defining the whole elaboration, but just particular points out of the elaboration so that they are consequential to this teaching. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, this is verse 8, Daniel 8, verse 8, when he was strong, his great horn was broken. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of the heaven. Verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. 10, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Now when one third of all the stars of heaven have been cast down to earth by the tail of the dragon, and Satan and all his star cherubim angels are cast down to the earth, how can there be any other stars left unless they are stars of the cherubims and the seraphims which really had no part in that constructive event that happened with the war in heaven for these stars to be cast down it's very very important so when i in one of the introductory uh, things uh, shared with you that i would be teaching about this domino effect, domino effect, and I explained to you in another teaching what that was. I did not have time to explain to you that the thing about the stars being cast down and us having the power to prevent that, of how that could be. And I want to explain that to you today. Because when I put these things in the different writings, they are not hyperbole. They are not hyperbole. They have succinct, actual meanings that have particular application. Now, take a note that in verse 10, then verse 10, the word stamped, S-T-A-M-P-E-D, upon them. The term stamped used here can mean stomped on and trampled. But even so, it implies the main point being submission. It does not really teach of life destruction, but of trampling them, stomping on them, stamping them to bring about submission. Now Strong's Hebrew Concordance Dictionary, Hebrew 7512, and also Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, Hebrew 7 or H7554, applied for Daniel 719, uses stamped. It's T-A-M-P-E-D, meaning to pound out a sign, to expand a plate by hammering, to stretch it, remember I mentioned the stretching thing, for putting on an outlay of printing on it. Here then is an early Bible scripture that I have never ever heard anyone use. I'm not saying that someone has not, but I've never heard it. On the mark of the beast. And the imprinting that was to go upon the bodies of those persons who were submitted. In the book of Revelations, the giving part and the taking part of the mark of the beast is a very serious decision of life 
affecting that life. And the story about it is in Revelations, chapter 13, verses 6, 16 through 17, chapter 14, verse 11, chapter 15, verse 2, chapter 16, verse 2, chapter 19, verse 20, and chapter 20, verse 4. It's a big subject in the book of Revelations. And so here we have something very, very important connected to the stamping of the stars that are cast down to the ground and it's to bring them into submission. What exactly then is this about? As to the stars cast down, the reference is to specific entities. These particular angels obtained the status of morning star ambassadorship but not yet first domain status. In other words, these are people of the Ophanim that fell, took bodies, and that overcame to the point that they were given the title of elect angel, which is also involved in the ministry of dignities and dignitary. And so we have these elect angel that have had a high degree of restoration and they have become raised to this angelic place again where they have obtained a status of Morning Star ambassadorship but not yet obtained their first domain status. So they are only what is called elect angels described in 1 Timothy 5.21 KJV, which nevertheless is a high degree of restoration. Consequently, they are still susceptible to err and to fall. These elect angels work as dignitaries, making appearances to persons of God to aid them. Revelations 19.10, where a dignitary appeared to John, and and John began to worship. John began to worship that dignitary, and the dignitary said, "No, no, no! Don't do that. I'm just one of you. I'm 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 one of the prophets. I'm one of the I'm one of the people." He was a dignitary. He had become a dignitary elect angel. He was an elect angel, and he had come down to do work on earth. And they're very, very important to us. These elect angels. I, I think it's very possible that this angel that appeared to me to give me these new revelations that I call an Arturian may have been an elect angel. They're very, very important in their ministries. And these angels that work as dignitaries, making appearances to persons of God to aid them, also appeared to Daniel. Now, first as I said, appeared to John in Revelations 19.10. Other, other such ones appeared to Daniel, chapter 10, 10 through 20. These di dignitaries uh, warred with the prince of, of the demon of Persia. And so we see, as we get into this, that these were dignitaries that were involved in the forces of these different nations. So they were dignitaries that had been chosen to work in those particular nations, like Persia and, and Babylon. And so they were fighting these physical forces and doing their spiritual jobs, but they were still susceptible. And here we have this evil force that has come against, is prophesied to come against some of them and pull them down from the heavens, smash them down on the ground, make them subject it, make them submit it, and put upon them the consequences of taking the mark of the beast. And this is revealed. Why is this revealed? It's revealed to the children of God and the ministries of God so that they will realize that these are assets that belong to them. These people that overcome and reach those, those elect angel positions are assets to you because they are up there 
And they are the ones that the Bible describes that are bringing charges against Lucifer, Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren and causing the brethren to, to, to not be able to be accepted before God, if they can. So what do we do about this? God is able to raise up prophets such as Ezekiel who will come in prophecies against the war cities and evil kingdoms and strongholds of the forces dark. God gave Ezekiel power to use prophecy to bring down defended cities and strong nations. He told Ezekiel, I will give you the power to go out and you will be able to prophesy against cities that have become evil. You'll be able to prophesy even against nations and their, and their powerful rulers that are evil. And you will be able to cause those nations to come down because of your prophecy. Well, I knew that we, by the Spirit of God, could defend these stars. Morning star elect angel dignitaries who are working for us. Angels that we often entertain unaware. And we could come against the forces dark in the spirit of manifest prophecies because we have the knowledge to know what we can do and what to do. And we can rebuke them, rebuke the forces that are trying to trample upon them and pull them down and cast them back to earth. And we can prevent that by prophesying for the failure of Lucifer in those enactments. And I think this revelation is actually a premise of essentiality for the saints of God. Because it says the saints of God, with this message and with the power as Ezekiel was given to prophesy, God said to Ezekiel, see those dead out there? They're, they're white at bones. No one would ever expect um, any miracle could ever do anything about it. Now, let me show you what God can do. Start breathing until the breath of God begins to come in you. The spinning of the Holy Spirit begins to happen in you. Start breathing until the breath of God begins to come to words, words that can be spoken, that can be made to be flesh. And then begin to prophesy to the quickening and the whirling of the winds. Let the God winds go forth and sweep over those bones. And I tell you that if you prophesy, I will cause your prophecy to come to pass. And the bones began to come together shaking and, and a whole army of people were brought back to life. Well, there are so many important things. We need to know about this thing about the Father's house. Some people get really confused when you tell them that the Father's house is a planet. They'll say, no, 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 no. The Father's house, the Bible says it, it, it's a heaven. That is true. The Bible does say that. But the differentiation is the duality, which was part of my experience last night. The duality of the Word of God. That is so absolutely important. Without understanding the duality, you miss out on a major, absolutely succinct, important revelation that gives definition in a way that nothing else does. There is a heaven of heavens. Deuteronomy 10, 14, 2 Chronicles 2, 6, and Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 6, 18. Shamayim, Shamayim, Shamayim. What is that? That's a word for heaven. 
But it's a very unusual word. Shamayim. Strong's Hebrew diction- Dictionary, H8065, is a dual word. You can go and read that for yourself. What does that mean? That means that that word is not specifically singular, nor is it specifically pearl. It's not plural, it's not singular. It is different from either one. It means it is dual. And that that duality defines two distinct, different meanings of Shah Mayim, heaven. Now that's something you can check and read out, because you've got to get this straight. So the same Strong's Dictionary number includes the Hebrew word Shameh. The same number includes that. So that could have been used for a singular because that's a singular term. But it wasn't used because it was a a dual. And that could have been used instead for heaven. So then heaven with a cap represents a pure spirit energy heaven. Consequently, A firmament heaven of earth is made of physical substance. Therefore, the firmament heaven is made, when you draw it out, when you write it, type it, with a small H cap, no cap, a small H, H H-E-A-V-E-N. So now, when we are understanding There is only one time in the Bible that it ever describes a place that is the heaven of all the other heavens. It is exclusively the heaven of all the other heavens over all the other heavens. It's the capital H. All of the rest of the heavens are universal heavens. And they are physical heavens. And in the book of Genesis, It clearly describes it, clearly mentions it. We'll get to that as we go along here. And so we have absolutely biblical proof of this thing about heaven. Because if you don't get this thing about the heaven, you're not going to understand the Father's house. And probably not even believe that the Father's house is a planet. But when we're finished with giving you this revelation today, We're stretching this truth, not in a negative way, but we're stretching the truth because the Bible did that in creation. When God made the universe, the Bible says he stretched out the heavens to make it. And so the beauty and the glory and the awesomeness became a network of vast entry by this stretching effect. And so we see in this whole thing that Satan uses that technique too as he tries to hammer out, put pressure techniques, use his method of rapidity to keep slinging over and over a thought until it's like a drip that breaks a rock. But God is making his people wise to understand these things. So let's go on. The term heaven, small letter, no cap, in the Bible, more often refers to natural heavens symbolically representing a height state of atmospheric elements that are natural. However, this natural state of heaven is a pattern metaphor of a spiritual spirit heaven of God who is spirit. Consequently, meanings, entity angels of the first domain, capital heaven, do not need to have physical bodies, do not marry, nor are given in marriage. They, like God, the invisible God, who is a spirit, are neither male nor female. 
In the first domain, the heaven of heavens, they are not fathers, they are not mothers, they are not sons, they are not daughters, they are not brothers, they are not relatives, and they are not married. They are all connected to the spirit soul of God, and they all share equal love for each other. So angels in the first domain, the capital H, heaven, are spirits. And their spirit is a temple of the Holy Ghost and has many assets. And these assets empower angels to take on at well beautiful forms and to share minds and their stories with one another. The continued spirit asset, asset list is too long to even list here. But the potentiation of those assets of the spirit world would make any capability and potential of humans that they have on earth to not even be a drop in the bucket. Now, most people do not, by any reach of realism, have any close idea about spiritual and Holy Ghost things. Consequently, even the meaning of what heaven, capital H, is, is becoming a bobbling float of definition, usually blank of the real actuality. Why is the small h heaven with small caps subject to a part of what is the Holy Ghost? Here are the two main reasons, plus other reasons as well. To begin the verbal will and testament of Jesus Christ, written in the Gospels of the Bible, included two main provisions. I want to read that again. To begin the verbal will and testament of Jesus Christ, written in the Gospel of the Bible, included two main provisions. One, <coughs> a promise after his ascension to send the Holy Ghost Comforter. If I go away, I will send you the Holy Ghost. Now some people say, well, I don't understand that. I thought that the Holy Ghost had already been there. John the ba Baptist was born with the Holy Ghost. Jesus was born with the Holy Ghost. <coughs> In the Old Testament, there's people that had the Holy Ghost. Do you think that there is only one Holy Ghost? See, Jesus said, I will send you another comforter. You see, you have the major Holy Ghost, which is the Holy Ghost of the invisible God, whose spirit never leaves the first domain. But his Holy Spirit goes out into the universe and does an essential eternal work and is there. Now there's another Holy Spirit. Some would say, oh my God, I, oh now this is getting scary. You need your pants scared right off. You need to change clothes and dress up in a holy suit. You begin to really learn these things, you will know that it is God. Let's talk about Jesus Christ. Now Jesus says, my Father at the Father's house is greater than I. Because I took on the body of Abraham, I could have taken on an angelic body, but I chose to take on the body of Abraham so I could bear the sins of humankind. So my, in, the, in the state of men, my father is greater than I. But there is an asset that I have, but I cannot give it to you as long as I am here in the body. But it is a part of my personal duality. Because I am both physical, the Spirit made flesh, John chapter 1, 8, and I am Holy Ghost Spirit. Now my spirit is holy. A lot of you out there have spirits and they're not holy. But I have a Holy Ghost Spirit. And a lot of you people out there have Holy spirits that are not holy or spirits that are not, not even that degree. You've got to get some charges going. So Jesus said, I will send you my Holy Ghost. I will do something like what Moses was showing of the Lord to do. 
I will share my spirit with all of you who will believe. I have enough charge. I have enough ability to energize the whole world. For I so love the world through my Father God that I've given my whole self, including my spirit, for it. Blessed be the name of God. Are you hearing me, folks? So now, we've got the Holy Ghost. Do you think that the Spirit of Jesus would not be holy? I hope you wouldn't be that duped. Of course he has a Holy Ghost. And of course he's sharing that Holy Ghost. But there's another Holy Ghost out there that's in the whole universe. The Soundtron Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, even in the sense that the Father represents the God of the first domain, the Bible says that Jesus has a work that he goes hitherto, and the Father has a work that he goes hitherto. But although there are these different works and these different aspects that they are involved in, it is still all of the same spirit or of the same administration. And so now we're beginning to get into the duality. We're beginning to, to see in the very Hebrew of heaven how that there is a duality. And in that duality you have the physical earth which has a heaven and is clearly defined as we read it, in the sixth verse of the chapter 1 of Genesis, and God said, let there be a firmament. Notice the word F-I-R-M, firm in there, because you have these gases. In the midst of the waters, I let it divide the waters from the waters, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Now, they, in King James, do capitalize that. But it is not the heaven of heavens, but it's representative of the heaven of heavens. But it's a physical heaven, and it's a firmament. So the contextually, contextually, it is settled. Contextually, it is a physical heaven. Now, the scientists, the astronomers, are looking for habitable planets. They're trying to find habitable planets that would be habitable like the Earth. Well, you know, people think, well, I looked and I couldn't see house. I couldn't see house anywhere where it showed the house was a planet. Well, that's because you don't know the Bible. You don't really know that. You think you know the Bible, but you don't. Because there's many other kinds of words, and one of the words that people have missed is the word habitable and habitation. And the word habitation is many, many times in the Bible, and it does mean house. So when the Bible talks about habitation of the Father's house, that's equal to the house of the Father's house. And when he says, I go away to prepare a place for you, my, in my Father's house are many mansions, he is talking about the elaboracy of those houses and how they are different from what people live in and on earth because they are so elaborate, they are so beautiful. And he says, I'm going up there to prepare those physical, literal houses on that planet where you're going to be raptured to and I'm preparing it so you will have those houses to move into and it's literal. It's a literal place because, hey, come on. People that got this thing about everything's going to end just in a jiffy, any time now, the end of the world. This is a bunch of people that don't even know how to tie their own shoestrings, spiritually speaking. They don't even know what they're talking about. They think they do. They think they know. They're listening to somebody on the radio who swears he's had the revelation, been to heaven, came back. All he's had is a dream. And the dream was, was the release of ideas out of his own brain that he had listened to and put together and, and came out in spaghetti and meatballs. 
You need to listen to me, people. You need to hear what I have to say. So, the Holy Ghost Comforter, number one, was the promise. And the term Father's House is an important term with broad meaning, deep meaning. St. John 14, 1 through 4 is a victory statement by Jesus Christ bidding his disciples to return to where they once abode of habitation, which was before being lured away from their first estate. Jude 6, the angels left kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. That was a habitation. That was a physical place because the angels had taken on physical bodies. They needed a physical place, not a spiritual place, to stay. And they left their first estate, which was the Father's house back then, that they left. It was called a habitation. Break down habitation. It can mean heaven, earthly heaven, because every planet that doesn't have a heaven, doesn't have an atmosphere, does not have oxygen, does not have nitrogen, does not have the seven elements that come from the stars that the human body is made of, and that has the elements in, in that planet. And it's a connection of the whole thing, and it's beautiful, and it's positive. And so when they're looking for habitable planets, they're looking for planets that have firmaments. If a planet doesn't have a firmament, doesn't have an atmosphere, then it doesn't have a heaven. And then if it doesn't have a heaven, it's, a, it's not a planet that is habitable. And if it's not habitable, then it's not a place that you can build a house. And so the Father's house is hab habitation, and it's a heaven because the heaven denotes the planet. And so there's your proof that it is a planet. Because the heaven, meaning the firmament, is talking about an atmosphere that could only stay where an atmosphere could stay if the gravity of a planet was using the magnetism of its inner core to keep it there. And so... The term habitation refers to house and heaven. Psalms 26, 8. Look it up in the Bible. The term habitation refers to house and heaven. Psalms 26, 8. And Deuteronomy 26, 15. KJV, the Father's house habitation is described and located in the heavens of space. Physical, universal space. Psalms 65, 44 and 5 through 4 and 5, KJV, God rides in the heavens. He is the father of the fatherless as God in holy habitation. There you have the father's house. You have the father and you have the habitation, which also means house and heaven. And you have it right in the other scriptures and people have missed that because they didn't have a teacher of the Holy Ghost out there to show them these incredible truths. And so when Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking. Some of these people were not ready to be delivered. And they were taken away by the flood. But he said, you know, Noah and his Family were saved by the flood. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The Son of Man's made a provision like the Noah ark. And then it describes it in the Bible. It describes it in Matthew 24. And the people will be gathered from the four corners of the earth and they'll be caught up to meet him in the air. So in Luke, when it talks about Jesus being taken up and the Holy Spirit separating the disciples away from him as he is taken up, they're going to be in this. They're going to be taken to the Father's house. That's where they're going. Now, let me read something to you that almost sounds a little bit scary. But it's just fact. 
We're going to close this a little bit here. Just a fact. Some people say, well, you know, is time going to just go on and on? Well, here's what it says. So man lieth down and rises not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. For if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change shall come. So there will be people who did not regenerate successfully. Those people will not go to the Father's house. Those people will not go to other spirit prisons of waiting. Those people will go into a sleep. And they will not wake from that sleep until the end of the universe, when the great white throne judgment takes place. Now, no doubt, at that time, the majority of them will be accepted by Jesus Christ in forgiveness. And they will enter into their morning star kingdom, but they will have not gained any new stature, and they will have lost the stature that they had, and they will go in just as blank soldiers without any title. There is so much more to share. On and on and on. But it is time to close this awesome time with the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. What is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is everything that you need. The Holy Ghost is the answer, the solution, the power, the magnetism, the manifold. God bless you till next week. Janet Lee at the organ. <laughs>